It's my privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Hellman uh, from University of uh, Cincinnati. Uh, Dr. Hellman is an assistant professor in the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care um, since 2018. Uh, he had his medical degree from Ohio State uh, in 2011, uh, followed by residency uh, and chief resident uh, at University of Cincinnati, and then uh, fellowship at also University of Cincinnati and stayed on. So he's basically been there for quite some time. Uh, he's also currently the associate program director of the fellowship since 2019. And his uh, area of interest, as uh, you can see, it's uh, point of care ultrasonography, which is becoming very popular for uh, our intensivist and uh, our house staff. His talk today is uh, about uh, uh, the point of care ultrasound for the internist, which is very popular topic, and I uh, want to thank him for uh, taking time to visit with us, and uh, Dr. Hellman. Excellent. Thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Dr. Saad. I really appreciate it, and uh, I want to thank you for having me down to talk with you guys uh, about this wonderful topic. Like you said, I really enjoyed talking about point-of-care ultrasound. Um, I don't have any specific conflicts of interest or disclosures to discuss with you guys. Today, I'm going to talk a lot about my experience. Uh, my experience uh, with point of care ultrasound, some uh, situations where it's really gotten me out of a jam or helped me with uh, patient care. I'm going to talk a lot about point of care ultrasound versus consultative ultrasound. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the evidence behind where, how, why we use point of care ultrasound. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about our training program at University of Cincinnati, how we built the training program what troubles we've come across uh, in building it and uh, what successes we've had and try and share some of our experiences with you guys. So I'm going to come up uh, and talk with you guys about all sorts of situations I've encountered. Lots of stories and uh, ultrasound lends itself to lots of picture sharing. So, so lots of great pictures here for you. Uh, the, first one, the first situation was when I was in training, I was doing moonlighting. I moonlighted at our VA uh in the urgent care portion of the va and i remember working down there and we had uh one of the other providers in a different section of the ed uh was working with our vets and i love our vets these guys are awesome they're uh tough as nails uh as i'm sure you guys know uh and this this guy came in with with leg pain and the ed provider thought that uh he was an intermediate risk for having a dvt he had unilateral leg swelling and the issue was this was uh, a Saturday morning, and uh, I love our VA, um, but after about 2.45 on every weekday, things tend to shut down. So getting a, a lower extremity duplex on the weekend was not, was not going to happen. And uh, so then this provider, the, uh, the emergency doc on the other side of the ED and the vet started to get into it about what to do. The provider didn't feel comfortable sending him home. Uh, with possibly this DVT. The provider didn't feel comfortable sending him home with anticoagulation um, and got into a real pickle and got into a back and forth. And this comes up with what do we do in this situation? I'm going to ask you guys, um, and, and you can say it out loud or you can put it in the chat box or you can tell Jason, but, but what do you do in this situation? Do you send this guy home with anticoagulation? Do you not anticoagulate him? I'll say in this situation, the ED provider uh, wanted to either admit him, which our old vets are awesome, but they're not going to sit in the hospital over the weekend. Uh, they weren't ha He wasn't having it. Uh, and so this ended up with the ED provider calling out every hospital in the area trying to get a, a weekend lower extremity duplex, which also uh, wasn't happening. And uh, it was an unfortunate situation. They started getting back, uh, getting into it with each other with a back and forth and there was a, um, some bad feelings and it ended up being a, a frustrating encounter. Uh, and I can't help to, to think back to this day as I learned uh, bedside uh, compression sonography. Uh, in this situation, you can take an ultrasound. It takes maybe 30 seconds uh, to go and evaluate a leg, 30 seconds to a minute. And what you do is you take the ultrasound off in a linear probe, just like this, and put it over the vessels in the leg, the great vessels, and do some simple compression. So I'm going to show you uh, a uh, compression technique with somebody that does have a DVT. 
this is uh, a compression, and you can see that hyperechoic thrombus sitting in uh, the vessel there. And if you see the thrombus, you don't have to do that compression. You can see at the end of the video clip uh, doing a compression technique. And I'll say, if you see the thrombus, you don't have to do that because I'm gonna show you, if you turn your probe 90 degrees, uh, you might see this as well. And this is the other side of the thrombus here. Um, and you'll see, if you compress down here, can you imagine this thrombus flicking off and going to the heart? It's a potential risk associated with this. So if you see the thrombus, you don't have to do that. But this is a simple, easy bedside technique that can get you out of a jam in the middle of the night, can get you out of the jam in the VA emergency department on a Saturday morning, uh, and can really expedite the care of our patients. And this is how we do it. We take a look at the great vessels. You need to know the anatomy of the leg. And we do a compression test. Uh, there's lots of debate about how to do this. There's a, a two-point compression test where you compress at the common femoral vein and then the popliteal uh, vein. And some argue for going uh, further down and, and evaluating further down the superficial slash femoral uh, vein. And that's what I'll argue as well here shortly. This is a negative compression test, and this is just showing you how um, you go ahead and do a compression test. So you see the vein, and uh, you're working down the leg just quickly doing a comp compression test to make sure that the vessel completely collapses. And you'll notice um, at one point I try to compress and it's not completely collapsing. That's not a perfect evaluation in that uh, one point. Because uh, you really want to see complete collapse of the vessel to make sure that there's no clot in that vessel. So how do we do it? Uh, compression sonography, you know, it's different when we do it point of care assessment. You're, it's the provider, it's the doctor doing the assessment as opposed to a sonographer. Um, but we find that critical care docs are, are pretty good at assessing for clot uh, when we study this. When we translate this over to the internal medicine hospitalist, Again, you have uh, pretty excellent findings here as far as uh, they didn't miss any clots, um, but there were some where they weren't quite sure whether they were getting a full compression or not. Um, and, and so the specificity wasn't perfect, but again, a good test. When we train internal medicine residents in the two-point compression test, and then we study it, we found that they missed a lot of clots and they didn't miss any in the popliteal segment. They didn't miss any in the common femoral. But the, the method of the two-point compression test did miss several clots in the superficial femoral vein. So I think it's really important that we study how we teach point-of-care ultrasound so that we learn from our mistakes in our methodology. And from here on out, I teach all of my uh, residents and my fellows to go ahead and extend the compression test down from the common femoral vein uh, to the superficial femoral vein so you don't miss those clots. This brings up point of care versus consultative ultrasound. Uh, they're very different in that point of care ultrasound is limited in scope and it really addresses one dichotomous question. Does this patient have a DVT or not? Will this patient respond uh, to fluid challenge or not? Um, it's performed and interpreted uh, by the physician in real time to augment their physical exam and their other data in a real time encounter. And I'll say that point of care ultrasound at no point is a replacement for consultative ultrasound. I think that it's very appropriate to do a point of care ultrasound um, and then uh, use it in coordination with a full formal exam. I, I think that's very appropriate. Consultative ultrasound, on the other hand, is interpreted by subspecialists, cardiologists, radiologists, generally off-site at a different time and uh, doesn't just answer one question, it's a comprehensive evaluation of anatomy. There's lots of uh, different findings that are, may or may not be uh, applicable to the clinical situation and uh, lots of incidental findings as well. I really enjoy teaching point of care ultrasound. I think uh, one of my favorite aspects of it is there's so many different kinds of knowledge that goes into it. There's the medical knowledge of when it's clinically indicated, how to use point of care ultrasound, how you will apply it and bring it into your patient encounter. There's this discussion about this tactile knowledge that you really have to teach. And this is 
uh, even harder to teach than the medical knowledge uh, because you have to learn how to move, move your hand, manipulate the transducer uh, to agree with this mental map you have built in your head to find the images that you really need to find. There's this technical knowledge of how to manipulate the machine and how to uh, find and interpret the images that you're seeing, as well as this medical knowledge about how you're gonna apply uh, the findings to your clinical scenario. I think it's really important to stress, I stress here and I'll stress everywhere, uh, that all of our trainees, learners, and faculty really need to know their personal limitations when it comes to point of care ultrasound. Uh, I think it's a nightmare of mine uh, and I tell every trainee that I, that I come across that my nightmare is one of them is going to uh, poke a pericardial effusion and stab somebody in the heart, uh, and then that'll be the end of everything. So I, I stress this everywhere. I'll stress it here. I think it's very important that everybody knows their personal limitations when it comes to point-of-care ultrasound. This is a point-of-care ultrasound often split up into diagnostic and procedural. Um, diagnostic being cardiac, pulmonary, abdominal, vascular. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those encounters that I've had. When we talk about echocardiography, we often break it up into basic and advanced. And I really think that uh, for the internal medicine uh, trainee, the internal medicine faculty, um, and, and even in critical care, our fellows, our faculty, really basic bedside echo is much more important uh, to have a good grasp of basic bedside than it go into advanced. And we're when we're talking about basic bedside echo, we're talking about volume status, chamber size, and function, uh, we're not talking about ejection fraction. We're talking about normal or abnormal. And then uh, if it's abnormal, if it's severe or not severe. Uh, and then basic size, function, and severe valvular abnormalities that might be affecting your patient. Again, this is dichotomous questions. Will my patient improve with a volume challenge or not? Advanced bedside echo, um, I think for somebody in critical care, for somebody that uh, is evaluating shock states frequently, this is invaluable. Um, so uh, we delve into this, but I don't necessarily know that advanced bedside echo is necessary for everybody. This is uh, not everybody at this point needs to be doing diastolic assessments on all their patients. I'm going to talk about another patient here. Another encounter I've had has to do with echo. Uh, in our ICU, uh, this is before the COVID times. I, you know, at the time I didn't love it, but we have this just say yes policy where people show up um, mostly unannounced with very little information about them in our ICU, and they may, may be in very sh various shock states. Um, but I do I do miss that when they just showed up, uh, as opposed to uh, us being overflowing. But back in the Just Say Yes days, a 56-year-old guy from a very small emergency department uh, just showed up. And he had uh, reportedly had bloody bowel movements recently. He was anemic uh, with a hemoglobin of 4.5. And, and his troponin was 1.5. Uh, we've changed scales on our, that uh, since that time, but that's uh, elevated. Um, and I was with this emergency medicine, this fourth-year trainee. He was great. But these emergency medicine guys, they come up to our medical ICU and they really want to do stuff to people. They go into emergency medicine because they are uh, want to see the sickest of the sick. And then they uh, have uh, prescription refills over and over again. And, and so they, uh, it's not quite what they expected. So they come and round with us and they want to do stuff to people. And he heard this hemoglobin of four and a half. And so he had these big introducer catheters that he was going to jam in this guy's neck. He was ready to go. And so we took a second, we took a step back. He was talking to us. He was hypotensive, but talking. Um, and I held him back and we went ahead and took a look uh, at his heart as he came into us. And we did a basic view. This is a parasternal long axis where we evaluate the heart. Uh, generally you start in the second intercostal space on the left chest, just next to the sternum and work your way down with the pointer pointed towards the right uh, shoulder. And this is the basic view that you're looking at. I'm going to show you a fairly normal parasternal long axis before I go back to my patient. This is a fairly normal parasternal long axis with fairly normal cardiac function here. So back to our hypotensive patient with a hemoglobin of 4.5 and, and a troponin of 1.5. My ED residents uh, got blood bank on the phone ready to massively transfuse this guy. And we look at his heart, and this is 
uh, his scan here. And as you can see, his left ventricle, which is in the center of the view, this isn't a perfect view by any means, um, but his left ventricle is hardly moving at all. Uh, and maybe I just got to stop clicking it and it'll play again. But his left ventricle is hardly moving at all. And uh, we took an evaluation uh, of him even before we had even drawn labs, before we had EKGs. We had his old records to show that he had a previously normal uh, left heart function. And so we were able to talk with our cardiologists at 2 a.m. Of course, this always happens at 2 a.m. Uh, to bring them up because we were worried about this being an ischemic event uh, even before the labs were drawn. I'll say that the labs were drawn and his troponin was off the scale uh, and was off the scale for us at the time was greater than 75. Uh, and he was clearly having a, an ischemic event um, and the bedside echo uh, that we did right as he arrived uh, was, you know, nearly an hour before that troponin came back, really uh, expedited this patient's care, uh, drew us off of this red herring of the anemia, which ended up being chronic, and really clued us in that this was a cardiac event causing cardiogenic shock. And we find this same uh, scenario holds true when we study uh, point of care ultrasound in the hypotensive patient. When we evaluate point of, hypotensive patients when they arrive to either the ICU or the emergency department, uh, we have this broad differential. Is this guy GI bleeding? Is this guy have a PE? Is this an ischemic event? All sorts of things could be causing these patients shock. When we add point of care ultrasound to that initial evaluation, we cut our diagnostic uh, possibilities down. We cut our differential down tremendously. Uh, in the emergency department, this study, they had an average uh, potential differential diagnosis of eight at 15 minutes of, of arrival um, when they did not use ultrasound. And when they used point of care ultrasound for the evaluation of the hypotensive patient, they cut their potential differential diagnosis down from eight to four, cut it in half. And when we evaluate this, uh, the significance of point of care ultrasound in our critical care fellows, two thirds of the time, they have new diagnosis uh, on arrival for the hypotensive ICU patient. Um, and a third of the time, over a third of the time, it will actually change management for how our critical care fellows would have treated this patient otherwise. And this expands beyond the emergency department, it expands beyond the intensive care uh, unit uh, to the general medicine floors. These are general medicine patients that arrive to the floors and they're doing point of care uh, echo exams by internal medicine hospitalists. And half the time it gives extremely valuable information. And a quarter of the time it either changes the primary diagnosis or you have additional diagnosis uh, based on this. We've studied not only internal medicine hospitalists but internal medicine residents and again we find a quarter of the time, it either changes your primary diagnosis or you find really important additional diagnosis from just adding point of care echo exams. Uh, and this is not necessarily uh, patients that you really need. This is e examining all patients that come in and, and were evaluated by internal medicine residents. Now, how do we train bedside echo? Um, I'll say that this is very different based on uh, where, where you're applying it. So point of care ultrasound for the hypotensive patient or the general medicine patient uh, is different than the kind of training done by sonographers, different than the kind of training done by uh, cardiologists specializing in echo. Uh, and, and there's also different numbers, different uh, ways to determine how uh, good we become. I'll say that image interpretation uh, tends to be much easier than image acquisition. The learning curve is very hard for acquiring these images. You really need a fair amount of practice. So you teach it differently. You spend lots of time teaching your residents, teaching your fellows, uh, getting hands-on experience in image acquisition. I'll say that when we eyeball an echo uh, but via the eyeball method to see whether we think function is normal, reduced uh, and mild versus severely reduced, uh, we get pretty good at it uh, at between 25 and 50 exams uh, for image interpretation. And um, I'll say we were, we're not perfect, but we get uh, pretty good at, at evaluating whether uh, a patient's function is reduced or not. 
Now, image acquisition, it takes longer. We're talking 50, 75 exams for point of care ultrasound to get, uh, to get good at it. And I'll say we'll never quite reach the proficiency of a true sonographer, um, of somebody that spends their whole career doing this. Uh, but we get good enough to make assessments um, and make interventions based on this. And you'll notice that the curves actually dip down. Once we've done a whole lot of these, we start to get a little bit um, overconfident and, and even ignore uh, some findings that are, are obviously there. Uh, and so we actually have the curves even dip down once you've done a whole lot of uh, studies. I'm going to talk a little bit about pleural sonography and uh, ultrasound in the uh, general respiratory failure patient. This is a situation I had just recently. Um, I was on pulmonary consults and we were on the cardiology floor. Uh, we were evaluating, evaluate, evaluating a patient there and walking down the hall um, and uh, a nurse came out and pulled me aside. They said, hey, uh, doc, this patient is, uh, looks in distress. Can you help? I'm about to call a rapid. So I didn't really know this guy uh, outside of the fact that he had a pacemaker placed several hours, hours ago, an old guy, and he did look like he was in respiratory distress. So we pulled out an ultrasound and took a look at it. This is uh, Reyes, one of our fellows with her butterfly or handheld point of care ultrasound. We found that placing handheld ultrasounds on our consult services uh, is one of the excellent places to place them because you have it in your pocket at all times. And this is uh, just a similar image to the one we found. And I'm gonna invite somebody to unmute and read this for me. I'm all right with having an awkward pause if somebody wants to unmute and tell me if they can explain what we're seeing here with me. Looks like there might be a pneumothorax there. Yes, absolutely. And how are you seeing that? Can you explain why you think there's a pneumothorax? I think there's a lung point. There's a place where there's lung sliding and you have a place where there's no lung sliding. So that is pathognomonic of a pneumothorax. Excellent, excellent. So I'm gonna show, just for everybody else here, I'm gonna show an animation uh, and see if this makes sense to you that there's lung sliding on the right side of the screen and no lung sliding on the left side of the screen. Um, and you, this is really, just like you said, pathognomonic for, for pneumothorax, absolutely. Uh, you're very confident that this p patient has a post-procedural pneumothorax and needs decompression of this pneumothorax. So I'll say this patient got a chest X-ray um, while we were getting, and because we had the ultrasound, we were able to get everything ready for the chest tube uh, while we got the x-ray uh, and we were in the room, whenever you need the x-ray the most tends to be when x-ray comes the slowest, I'll say. Uh, and here's his chest x-ray and I'll put some arrows up because it's a little subtle via webcast where the exact pneumothorax is. And when we have, uh, when we compare ultrasound to chest x-ray, we find that ultrasound is much more sensitive for pneumothorax. Uh, you know, when you have a pneumothorax, the lung falls away from the anterior portion of the chest uh, because that's how it falls with gravity. And the chest x-rays don't necessarily pick that up if you just have a pneumothorax in the anterior portion of the chest. The ultrasound is much better for pneumothorax. And if you have uh, an area with lung sliding and no lung sliding, just like we said, that's very specific for uh, pneumothorax. So pleural ultrasound was generally ignored for many, many years. Uh, because ultrasound doesn't penetrate air. You get this barcode sign. But then what happened is that really smart docs uh, realized that you get different sort of artifacts from the ultrasound based on different pathologic states of the lung. And you get these different patterns that you can associate with different diseases. And when we evaluate ultrasound versus different kinds of modalities, for things like a pleural effusion, a consolidation, or a pneumonia, a quote interstitial syndrome, which may be a pneumonia, may be a, um, a, a, a pulmonary edema. Uh, we find uh, that when you auscultate, it, it, the accuracy is somewhere near a coin flip for some of this stuff. Although the tap in the barrel is an excellent uh, method for evaluating pleural effusion, it, it may not be the best. Uh, chest x-ray, again, leaves us hanging in a lot of areas. And 
for people that really know how to do pulmonary ultrasound, it's a wonderful modality. Um, it really mimics uh, CT imaging for a lot of its accuracy uh, without the radiation, without the time, without the expense. I'm going to talk a little bit about lung ultrasound. You got to bring it up in the COVID-19 pandemic. CT scans of our COVID patients, they're this multifocal ground glass um, and consolidation patterns. Uh, and everybody here has seen it at this point. And we find that this translates over to what we find in an ultrasound. In an ultrasound, when we do a exam of our COVID patients, we find a lot of B lines, just like this. And the B lines are the vertical lines uh, coming down in our scan, uh, and that's abnormal lung. And we find this in a very patchy distribution, just like we do in the CT scans. You'll have areas of normal lung right next to areas of uh, patchy consolidation with this sort of, uh, sort of B line pattern with this um, abnormal aeration of the lung. And Going one step further, if we look at the pleural surface, the pleural interface between the chest wall and the lung, normally it's this nice, smooth interaction, the ants crawling along the uh, lung, uh, crawling along the log, as they say. But in infected patients, uh, not only with COVID, but especially with COVID, we find a very jagged surface. And I'm going to play you a clip of this jagged surface. We call it the shred sign. I don't know if you guys can appreciate how it's not this nice smooth interface at the chest uh, wall, but instead it's, uh, there's this jagged uh, interaction between where the chest uh, interacts with the pleural surface. And again, this is uh, common findings of pleural ultrasound in the COVID-19 pandemic. It's been associated uh, that our, the severity of our evaluations uh, in COVID really uh, closely mimics the patient outcome. So uh, there are formal processes, formal protocols. The blue protocol, you obtain a lung ultrasound score, uh, basically determines how abnormal the lung is in several different areas, in the anterior chest, the mid-axillary, and in the posterior chest. Um, and you get a scoring, and this scoring correlates closely with the disease course, correlates closely with mortality, 90% uh, of patients with a lung ultrasound score greater than 25 required mechanical ventilation. And this can be a really useful tool, both in the triaging of our patients, as well as in the monitoring, uh, especially ventilated patients, um, uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, evaluation with lung ultrasound. All right, extending beyond uh, above the diaphragm, um, there's lots of abdominal ultrasounds, I'm not going to dive a lot into the evidence, but you can evaluate the, uh, the great vessels. Um, you can look for uh, aortic dissections and uh, aortic aneurysms just like this. Uh, you can evaluate the liver and the biliary tree. This is one of our exams, wildly abnormal. Um, this is a patient's liver in his right chest, and you can see all this. It looks like somebody took a shotgun to his liver. This guy had giant liver cysts. Um, on his abdominal exam, actually totally incidental and not related to why he was in the intensive care unit at all. Um, and then you can use it to evaluate the biliary tree as well. Look for gallstones, look for uh, biliary wall thickening, and if you're concerned for infections or any sort of clinically significant uh, biliary pathology. All right, I want to extend to procedural ultrasound. And I want to talk a little bit about line placement and training of line placement. Uh, this is probably the most common use of procedural ultrasound is uh, training uh, residents and, and fellows how to place vascular access. And I'll say that when you first do this, it, it's very much like uh, teaching your mom how to play PlayStation, if that analogy uh, translates to anybody, and that it's very awkward, you don't really get it, you have to line up your ultrasound probe and line up your needle and, and move everything together in coordination. And this can be really hard for the new learner. It's definitely a new skill set. And uh, we find that simulation translates over extremely well uh, to real time use. When we simulate um, ultrasound vascular access, the more we simulate this, the better people do um, the, uh, in accessing the vessel 
the quicker it is for people to get vascular access and, and the more success we have uh, for our residents and fellows. So uh, I get a lot of pleasure out of um, when my trainees, uh, when the fellows come, Dr. Hellman, Dr. Hellman, I can't get this, this very difficult radio art line. Uh, and I'll say I get even more pleasure when I know that uh, our fellows are well trained in, in getting these vessels beforehand. So um, I try to train these guys up uh, in the most challenging of situations so that uh, they can succeed uh, when they're independently here. And this is us looking uh, at the guide wire in a vessel. I'll say that uh, using ultrasound uh, for line placement has really become standard of care in, in, in almost all situations. Uh, the IJ uh, using ultrasound reduces complication rates, it improves success rates, uh, it, you spend less time, you spend, have fewer sticks, and uh, there's some thought that it actually reduces infections, although we haven't demonstrated it well in the literature, um, but we think that that's the case because you're spending less time and less pokes in the neck. I'm going to talk through another case situation that I had, um, and this one is one of those cases that sticks with you. This is a, a CT, and I'll, I'll describe the situation. This patient was uh, a prior quadriplegic from a, a motor vehicle accident, and pulmonary was consulted because the patient had a large pleural effusion. And so uh, we did a, a, a thoracentesis, and uh, later that day there was a rapid response called, and the patient... Uh, ended up going for a CT scan, and this is his CT scan. I'm gonna, I've got about four or five slices here. This is up towards his head and neck. You'll see he has an ET tube in there already. And you'll notice on the left chest, uh, there's not much lung. In fact, uh, it's fully occupied by this large pleural fusion. And that the white space in the middle of the chest there that's actually our, our chest tube that the effusion is laughing at. That's the overnight team placed this chest tube uh, after we had left. And uh, you'll see the heart squished way over there into the right chest. Uh, you can tell why this patient was hypotensive. You can tell why they weren't doing well. Um, and this is another reason why in a hemothorax, you never place a small bore chest tube because the hemothorax will laugh at your small bore chest tube in the chest, and it will not adequately drain, and you will still be in tension, hemothorax, and your patient will still be crashing. So this patient had a, a, a thoracentesis, and they uh, went to, uh, after getting a large bore chest tube, they went to interventional radiology, and they had the effusion drained, uh, or, or they, uh, large bore chest tube to drain the hemothorax, and then they went to interventional radiology, and they had this wonderful picture of this intercostal artery that was uh, blossoming away. Uh, they got that embolized and, and they actually did okay. But uh, I'll say that uh, from here on out, it's really been practice changing and that I always evaluate for a large or aberrant intercostal artery with venous dupl with duplex ultrasound uh, right before I do any thoracentesis. Uh, this is a situation you never wanna find yourself in and you're there with ultrasound anyway, just throw color duplex on there and see if you have any large vessels there, just like this. Beyond uh, looking for intercostal arteries, uh, we've shown that it, uh, using ultrasound during thoracentesis significantly reduces um, complications, it increases success rate, uh, and this is um, ultrasound that's done either uh, real time at the bedside. This is not when you send your patient off for an ultrasound via radiology. I can't imagine, I can't believe that that used to be the case, but uh, paracentesis and thor thoracentesis, I think this was, that was before my times even though. Paracentesis, again, it's standard of care. It increases success rate, reduces bleeding, reduces hospitalization rates, reduces mortality. All right, I want to talk a little bit about our training program and where internal medicine fits in the scheme of things. I will say that, um, I hate to admit it, but the surgeons were ahead of us. Uh, in 1997, they uh, really started rolling out uh, point-of-care ultrasound into their training programs. They included uh, point-of-care ultrasound into their training requirements, the American College of Surgeons did. Uh, and then in 2008, uh, 
emergency medicine began to mandate training into their uh, into their training programs. Uh, and then uh, in 2012, the ACGME designated ultrasound as a core competency of emergency medicine training. Uh, after emergency medicine, anesthesia uh, got on board with mandating training into their milestones. This is a couple years old, but U.S. medical schools, about two-thirds of them, have point-of-care formal ultrasound curriculums. Again, a couple years old, but uh, pulmonary critical care fellowships, about half of them had point-of-care uh, formal ultrasound curriculums. Internal medicine residencies, somewhere around a, a quarter of them have formal inter, uh, curriculums. And then family medicine residencies, about, about a fifth of them do. And how are we using it in general internal medicine? When we survey uh, program directors, everybody's using it for central lines. Everybody's using it for paracentesis and thoracentesis. Uh, and then it starts to drop off how many internal medicine residencies are doing basic cardiac evaluations, how many internal medicine residencies are, are evaluating for DVT, et cetera, with point of care ultrasound. There are lots of barriers to education. I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about a few of them. I, I can't help but bring up pandemic times. Uh, we've had to do a lot of uh, online learning such as this. There's a lot of technical issues that come up when you try to uh, play clips in ultrasound via uh, remote learning. Uh, and so there's been a lot of barriers with this, but we've built some uh, website repositories for our lectures. We've uh, sort of overcome a lot of these technical issues and, and built some methods for us to do asynchronous learning. Check out our website. Uh, we built this uh, as a learning tool uh, and a recruiting tool for our, our pulmonary uh, critical care fellowship. Uh, but we have a lot of our lectures on there as well. I'll say that, um, when you are teaching hands-on skills, nothing really replaces uh, small group in-person learning. So this has been very difficult. And uh, luckily, as everybody's been vaccinated, the rules have lightened up. We've been able to have some small group education, just like you guys are talking about, and lots of simulation. Other barriers, when we survey perceptions to barriers for ultrasound education, we find mostly it's a lot of time and cost. Uh, how are we gonna get uh, educators, the time to train, uh, how are we going to get uh, pay for them to train? And I'll say that really cost is a perceived barrier, but it's really time. Uh, how do we make the time for our faculty to train and learn? Uh, and it really, we, we have to identify a champion to take up the educational role. We need to build systems because one person can't do it alone. And I think the way you start to build your systems is you start with faculty development and you start educating the educators. Uh, here's Dr. Lenz uh, doing some shared learning uh, sessions with us. He's our uh, pulmonary critical care fellowship uh, program director. And I'll say that one of the great parts about point of care ultrasound is that faculty, fellows, trainees, everybody wants this information and everybody enjoys learning about it. And there's no stepping on toes, people aren't, there's no egos involved in it. Everybody loves learning side by side. So. Uh, whereas, you know, you might get uh, some faculty member grumpy if you're trying to teach him acid base. Uh, nobody gets grumpy about learning hands-on ultrasound. They, they love participating with the trainees. So you really need to invest in this educational culture by training the trainees. And, and this will help you create a lasting environment beyond any one person coming and going, beyond me coming and going and teaching uh, point-of-care ultrasound. We have a lot of internal opportunities. Uh, you know, online learning was uh, less um, uh, was less commonplace, but uh, we had some great online learning opportunities that we uh, used to treat or teach our fellows and our faculty. Uh, CAE ICCU has a great online uh, module system that we teach everybody, and then uh, send them both internal as well as external uh, workshops. There are wonderful workshops put on by CHEST, put on by the Society of Hospital Medicine. Everybody has wonderful workshops and we're, they're starting to get back to them. Um, there, there's lots of weekend opportunities where you spend a weekend in, in Chicago and, or spend a weekend at one of these training sites and work with people to really learn these skills. So infrastructure. I will say that um, 
I'm going to give you some tips about infrastructure, uh, but really, uh, this is all that you need are, are the learners and the patients. Um, machines, we have Sonosites, we use Sparks here. We've just started going to some handheld, the Lumify uh, ultrasound as well as uh, the butterfly. This picture of the butterfly is too cool. I couldn't help but put that in there. Uh, but really, the only infrastructure you need are the patients to scan and uh, and the learners. Uh, you really don't need to build other things. There's There are some other structures we've built here, and I'll talk to you a little bit about them, though. It all starts with didactics, and the didactics of ultrasound lead very smoothly into simulation. I think you really quickly need to move from theory uh, to simulation and hands-on learning because the hands-on portion does have a much slower learning curve, and you really need to spend a lot of time in that. We do a lot of simulation and precepted scanning on both simulators and real patients uh, because you really need that immediate feedback on image acquisition. So uh, a quick sort of testing turnaround, figuring out, fumbling, a lot of struggle time is absolutely necessary to teach point of care ultrasound. So our educational uh, symposiums, our electives will look like this. We'll introduce a topic, we'll have some time on a model or a simulator, and then to really get them out to do some precepted ultrasound. And then we'll have some group portfolio sharing, uh, bring back the images that people have gotten and share them with each other, and then we'll move on to a next topic. So our uh, setup may be similar to this. We'll introduce a topic, uh, general ultrasound, we'll practice uh, transthoracic echo, we bring in some models to practice, uh, and then we'll do some scanning, and then have people show us what they find on real patients, uh, have them see how difficult it is to get images and share them with everybody, and then move on to another topic and repeat this over and over and build add-on components to the whole body ultrasound exam as they go. Again, I really think simulation is a key portion of this. Uh, not you can do it without simulators, but they make it really easy to build that mental map of what you're looking for uh, in real time. I think there are good simulators and there are bad simulators. I think the simulators where it teaches you the hands-on positioning uh, and you get to learn the precise movements are, are some of the better simulators we can have and expose our, our trainees to early in their ultrasound experience. From past this precepted scanning, we really go in to review the learner images, and then we get them exposure to additional pathologies. So just like I was showing you guys here, pathology that they may not experience in their day-to-day -day, uh, uh, life, but what, when the patient comes in with a severe situation, they'll, they will have seen it before, and they will recognize this. And then we go into building their portfolio and their quality assurance feedback. And the way we do that, uh, Every day, every year during fellow interview time, we will interview these residents, these fantastic residents, uh, interviewed a, a few residents this past year from Louisville, wonderful residents. And I always ask them if they have a point of care ultrasound uh, sharing system um, from within their hospital. And it used to be about a third of, of our applicants said, yeah, our, our hospital does have this. And it's growing. Now it's somewhere around half of hospital systems seem to have, have this system, um, just like sharing radiology images. So uh, our trainees or our physicians, uh, wherever they are, will do a point of care ultrasound exam. And this will immediately be uploaded into our point of care ultrasound sharing system. We use QPath E. And this is a tremendous tool on all sorts of different uh, basis. It's a clinical tool. We'll communicate this with other providers, just like I showed you that cardiac exam earlier. Uh, I called down to our cardiologist, said, hey, I have this echo. Take a look at it right now in, in QPath. Uh, I think this is an ischemic event. Uh, this is what I'm seeing. Uh, we need your help. And this saves, you know, hours. It's always at 2 a.m. when the cardiology fellow has to drag his ultrasound up from several floors away. Uh, you've already done the exam. It's already in the system. Uh, you're already communicating the findings to your consultants. Uh, we use it as a billing tool. I heard you guys are getting epic. Congratulations, uh, I think. Um, uh, it, this system will automatically load our uh, exams into the lasting chart within Epic so we can bill and get revenue based on uh, our ultrasound exams. Uh, we use this as an educational tool. This will uh, automatically de-identify all of our uh, 
exams, and we can use it during presentations such as this. Uh, we use it to build the trainee's portfolio and see how many exams that they've done. And then we also use it to give uh, as a mechanism to give quality assurance and feedback to our trainees. Uh, you'll notice on the right side of the screen, there's a section where I will go in and compare their interpretation to a formal study interpretation and see what they got right, what, what they got wrong, and give them tips and tricks to try and improve their scans in the future. And then we build this into a competency assessment as well uh, to get them credentialed for their next institution. Credentialing is a wild, wild west. So we really try to build a tangible report that we use as a progress report during training and then as a credentialing uh, tool after training to say, this is exactly what uh, they've done when they leave here. I'll say that uh, ultrasound is, is a challenging modality in that uh, the skills absolutely degrade with time. And the hardest part about building a ultrasound training program is how do we build this infrastructure to get this broad education to all of our residents, all of our trainees over time? Uh, University of Cincinnati has 30-ish categorical residents. I'm sure Louisville is somewhere around the same. Um, when you train these skills and then you do a six-month follow-up, you see that the skills degrade significantly over time. Whereas if you have a built-in system to periodically, regularly, uh, reinforce ideas to continue uh, training, you'll see that you don't get this degradation in skills over time. So all of our trainee, trainees were trying to uh, build these sort of longitudinal experiences for them, as well as encourage them to get their hands on an ultrasound probe uh, as frequently as they can. Future directions, especially at the University of Cincinnati, uh, we do a lot of educational research and um, uh, research when our trainees are ready for independent practice, when our trainees are ready for independent procedural uh, use. That's a difficult question uh, for competency. I'll say that from a procedural standpoint, uh, we do lots of evaluations on simulations. Uh, we use lots of simulators for uh, educational evaluations. Uh, this blue phantom, this is, uh, I stole this from the internet yesterday. Uh, a four-vessel training tool costs a, a cool $550. Um, a homemade Jello uh, training tool uh, costs a cool $10. And so we use these training tools. You can use ballistics jelly. You can use uh, gelatin like this, uh, and it, it's ex extremely helpful. And you know, a small fraction of the price. We have expanded some of this beyond vascular access uh, to some of our research projects that we're going on are for training uh, endobronchial ultrasound, so bronchoscopy. So this is uh, a basic sort of airway that we've built. Uh, and we found that uh, this very well mimics the experience of doing an endobronchial ultrasound and, and needle biopsy uh, to evaluate for cancer and other pathologies in, in real patients. And uh, so my wife pokes fun at me uh, as a jello connoisseur, but uh, here we are, uh, and we've gotten pretty sophisticated with build building these simulations. You know, uh, a bronchoscopy and an endobronchial ultrasound simulator will cost tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, this jello uh, mold will cost uh, about two to three hours and, and $30. So uh, it, it's been an invaluable experience for our pulmonary critical care fellows, and we're doing lots of investigational uh, training in, in simulation and in, in point of care ultrasound as well. I think across the country, there's lots of new fellowship opportunities for point of care ultrasound. Uh, a lot of it is on the coasts, but we're recognizing that this is fantastic training and we need more educators. If anybody listening really wants to partner and be an ultrasound educator, uh, we, we need more at Cincinnati. We need more everywhere. We'll, we'll help uh, build that into your career. But people are recognizing that these fellowships are really important, and, and these are popping up all over. Beyond that, we live in weird times. We have Boston Dynamics having dancing robots. Uh, the tricorder is now a real thing, and we're doing point-of-care ultrasound on the International Space Station on a regular basis, uh, the FAST exam at Mach 20. So uh, the future is now, uh, and who knows, we'll be on Mars uh, in the flesh shortly, I guess. 
That's all I have for you. I want to thank uh, first the residents. You can tell this is an old picture. Uh, the social distancing gives uh, it, it's different times for sure now. You get a little uh, heebie-jeebies with uh, thinking about the social distancing from now to then. Uh, but I also want to thank some of my partners across University of Cincinnati. This is Dr. Bonomo and Dr. Lori Stoles, fantastic ultrasound educators across the University of Cincinnati. My program uh, directors, Dr. Warm and Dr. Lenz in residency and fellowship uh, in particular, have been fantastic in, in giving me the time to pursue, uh, pursue some of these interests. And my boss is Dr. McCormick and Dr. Ruan, uh, again, building this into a career uh, with me has been fantastic. Thank you guys very much. I have some time for questions, if you guys have any. I can't monitor the chat as we go, so I don't know if there have been some. Uh, nothing quite yet, but uh, if anyone has any questions for Dr. Hellman, you can unmute your microphone and ask that, or also, as he mentioned, if you want to type it in the chat area, we, he, I think he can see it or, I can, or we can read it for him. So uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, go ahead. Hi, uh, this is uh, Rodrigo Cavalas. This was an excellent lecture. Thank you so much. Um, for your pulmonary fellows, are you all creating a curriculum for transesophageal echocardiogram? I know this is advanced ultrasound, but I was just curious. It's a wonderful question. It's a wonderful question. Um, we have been exploring it, and we haven't pulled the trigger yet. We, we have the equipment here to do transesophageal echoes. Uh, we have built some of the protocols, the cleaning systems, there's a lot of infrastructure around it. Uh, we have, uh, I think I showed you in one of our slides earlier, we have do some training to introduce them to the concepts. Um, I showed one of our anesthesia docs was uh, walking our fellows and, and residents through a simulator on TEE. Uh, we have not uh, yet pursued formal training on getting them credentialed for TEE. It's, a, it's an option, it's a pathway uh, if people are interested in it, but we haven't yet pulled the trigger on getting everybody TEE trained. I think it's the future. I think um, it, more and more institutions will have critical care docs TEE trained. I think having somebody in your division, somebody in your department able to do TEEs um, to, uh, in the middle of the night or to help facilitate when you can't get uh, a cardiology done study or an anesthesia done study is, is it's coming. All right, any, any more questions for Dr. Hellman? Uh, you can go ahead, right, go ahead right now. Dr. Hellman? Yes. Uh, do you think that uh, the butterfly ultrasound will replace the stethoscope and should it, do you think we'll give better uh, care since we're really not that good with stethoscopes anymore? I, you know, I think in a lot of places it has. I think in a lot of places it already has. Uh, Dr. Bonomo on the screen here, uh, you know, uh, has replaced his with his, his stethoscope with his butterfly ultrasounds. Especially in the ICU, there's uh, so many hemodynamic and respiratory changes that uh, I think critical uh, that bedside echo is invaluable. Um, I think uh, the COVID pandemic has caused a lot of us to ditch our stethoscopes because we all have to use the contact ones anyway on every single patient. Uh, and, and we can't hear anything in those contact ones <laughs> anyway. Uh, I think the butterfly ultrasounds are very helpful in our cleaning protocols. So we've actually added butterflies to our evaluations because they're much easier to clean in the COVID patient room than the big bulk, bulky ultrasounds, especially when you don't need all of the information that the larger ultrasounds can, can use. So I think COVID has progressed the butterfly ultrasounds prevalence, and, and I do think it will continue to uh, work its way into replacing the stethoscope. Uh, I, I totally agree with you. Well, I appreciate you guys' time. I appreciate you guys having me down. It, it was a real joy, and, and, and I have a passion for this. If anybody uh, is interested in um, point-of-care ultrasound or exploring it more with me, I'd be happy to work with you guys, work with 
uh, Hiram and, and some of you guys from the uh, training side with your fellows as well. It'd be a, a real pleasure. Good to talk to you. Thank you very much. Appreciate yeah, thank the you time. Very much. That was fantastic. You're a great speaker. <laughs> I learned a lot. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Hillman, uh, before you go, um, we do have a tradition here in the Depart U of L Department of Medicine that, uh, and even and although we're, we're going virtual, we we, we continued it. Uh, uh, we get we get a little gift for our visiting speakers, a little something that uh, uh, is synonymous with the city of well, with Louisville. And so, in a few days, you will be receiving your very own um, personalized Louisville Slugger bat. Oh, perfect! <laughs> Love it. That's so, awesome. Excellent. Yeah, so, yeah, so it'll it'll have your name, the date, um, U of L Grand Rounds, and uh, we'll uh, so uh, U UPS will be dropping something like this off for you here in a few in a, sometime, probably first of the week. So uh, that's wonderful. I couldn't be more excited. I've been down there to the factory and the museum and seen the bats get made. That's that's really exciting. Perfect gift. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you, and again, thank you for an absolute a great presentation today. Thank you. And, uh, and just to let everybody know, we will be back here as usual next week, 8 a.m. Thursday. Um, it'll be March 4th next week. And we will be presenting uh, from actually from the Division of Endocrinology. It'll be the annual Beverly Todd Towery Lecture. And we will be welcoming uh, Dr. Robert Eckel from the University of Colorado for, uh, for this year's Towery Lecture. So uh, looking forward to that. And uh, again, again, that's uh, next Thursday, 8 a.m., same, same place, same channel. So. Uh, Again, thank you everybody for joining us this morning and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you next week. Thanks everybody. Thanks Jason. Thank